Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Western Region Colloquium. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Robert Hazen. Um, Bob Hazen is a research scientist at the Carnegie Institute of Washington's Geophysical Laboratory, and he is also the Clarence Robinson Professor of Earth Science at George Mason University. He is principal investigator of the Deep Carbon Observatory, a 10-year international effort to advance knowledge of the chemical and biological roles of carbon in the Earth's interior. His book, Genesis, The Scientific Quest for Life's or Origins, describes the role of minerals in the origin of life and his new approach to mineralogy, mineral evolution, explores the co-evolution of the geo and biospheres, which he'll talk more about today. Bob served on the Committee of, on Public Understanding of Science of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and on advisory boards for NOVA, Earth and Sky, Encyclopedia Americana, and the Carnegie Council. He appears frequently on radio and television programs on science and developed two popular video courses, The Joy of Science and the Origins of Life, both produced by the teaching company. He received his BS and SM in geology at MIT. Uh, he, went, he went on to get a PhD in earth science from Harvard and was a NATO postdoc fellow at Cambridge University. He has authored more than 350 articles and 20 books on science, history, and music. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Distinguished Public Service Medal and of the Mineralogical Society of America in 2009. He also served as Distinguished Lecturer for the Mineralogical Society of America and is a past president of the Society. And with that, I'd like to welcome Bob. Thank you, Darcy, and thank you all for being here. It's such a pleasure to be at the USGS. My very first job 43 years ago was as a USGS field assistant in Colorado. And I realize now that some of the ideas I want to tell you about today certainly had their genesis in some of the observations we made all those years ago. I worked with Pete Toolman, was his field assistant. So it was, it's really kind of nostalgic uh, giving a talk at the USGS. And I want to tell you about some ideas and some recent developments related to an article that appeared uh, almost three years ago an article called Mineral Evolution, a new way of thinking about mineral, minerals and mineralogy, framing it in a historic context. And this effort involved the collaboration of a number of scientists from different earth science backgrounds. Dominic Papineau is a geobiologist, now teaching at Boston College. Wouter Bleeker, a scientist working primarily in Archean terrains in the Geological Survey of Canada. Bob Downs and Heshon Yang run the Rough Mineral Database Project at the University of Arizona. John Ferry at Johns Hopkins is a metamorphic geologist who is particularly interested in fluid rock interactions. Tim McCoy at the Smithsonian, a meteorite expert. And finally, Dmitry Sverjensky, uh, my closest professional colleague who is a theoretical geochemist and has really been fundamental in developing some of these ideas in a more rigorous way. So, mineral evolution. What do we mean by mineral evolution? We're really talking about a change over time in several aspects of the mineral world. And most important, I suppose, just as sort of the poster child of mineral evolution is just the diversity, the number of different mineral species that occur at or near Earth's surface. But there are many other aspects as well the relative abundances of minerals at the surface, the compositional ranges of trace, major, and minor elements in those minerals. They change through time, too. And even things like the grain sizes, the morphology of crystals, there are fundamental changes through time, and they're telling us something about Earth's near-surface environment. We focus on the upper three kilometers of Earth's crust, and for several reasons, I mean, that's the part that's accessible for primary study, but also it's most likely to be observed on other planets and moons. And we work, this work is closely associated with and is partly sponsored by NASA and the astrobiology program. So we're interested in comparative planetology. And it's also, this is the part of Earth that's going to be directly influenced by interactions with the biosphere, the living world, microbial life in particular. So why do this? 
Why would we introduce something called mineral evolution? Well, part of this is an effort to reframe mineralogy. I'm a mineralogist. I was trained in mineralogy and crystallography, and I have noticed over the last four decades a real decline in the fortunes of this field. There was a time when every university, and you all are familiar with this, every university had a mineralogy professor and so forth. And except for universities in Europe where there's a separate department of mineralogy, that's just not true anymore. And indeed, the role of minerals has become less and less central to our understanding of Earth history, even though most of the data that we get on Earth comes from those solid samples. So, so it was a way of thinking about mineralogy in a new framing, a new context. It's a way to classify various terrestrial planets and moons, because as you'll see in today's talk, different terrestrial bodies reach very different stages of mineral evolution. It's also a way to explore general principles of complex evolving systems. And this, taking a step back from mineralogy and even the earth sciences, you know one of the great controversies today in, in American education, science education, is this question of evolution. Is evolution a plausible explanation for what happens in the biological world? Well, what we are arguing is that evolution actually is a universal characteristic, and you see it in many different aspects of the natural world. Mineralogy is just one other domain in which there's a kind of evolving property, and we'll see what that means in a moment, but, but this becomes then a pedagogic tool, because if you see evolution occurring in all different domains, in isotopes and elements, in minerals, in organic molecules leading to the origin of life, why should biology be any different? And finally, it's a way to pose new mineralogical questions, which is the way I'm going to conclude the talk today, to look at some of these new types of questions, which really provide some really s uh, remarkable insights, I think, into the history of our planet. So, a comment on the word evolution. Uh, some people have objected to using the word evolution in the context of mineralogy, and I just want to emphasize that evolution has several different meanings, and we need to know exactly what we're talking about. One is just this context of change over time, and that's been used in earth sciences for a long time, the evolution of the igneous rocks by Norman Bowen is a classic example. There's also the implication of complexification through time. You go from simpler to more complex, less diverse to more diverse, more patterned, more interesting behaviors as systems, as complex systems evolve. There also is an implication of congruency, that is, each stage of evolution depends in some way on the stages that came before, and that is certainly true as we'll see in the mineral world. But we are not talking about Darwinian evolution. This, this is a cartoon that appeared shortly after the appearance of our article in New Scientist. So, so um, we're certainly not talking about any kind of natural selection or mutation, quartz is quartz is quartz throughout geological history and so forth. So this is not what we're looking at. Okay, so the starting point of mineral evolution. I was really astonished to realize when we started thinking about this that I had never heard the question asked, what was the first mineral in the cosmos? We had the Big Bang. Produced hydrogen, produced helium, produced a small amount of lithium. No minerals there. You could condense that and make maybe diatomic hydrogen, no mineral there. So what was the first mineral? And what we realized was it probably was one of the polymorphs of carbon. And it occurred in an exploding star, in the envelope of an exploding star. So you make the first big star, the star goes supernova, it explodes. The expanding envelope has lots of carbon, has oxygen, silicon, nitrogen. And so what you do is you get still dense enough that you can condense a solid phase, but cool enough that you can produce these very refractory materials. And so the polymorphs of carbon, diamond is probably the first, graphite, maybe some nitrides and carbides along the way, some very simple oxides, maybe a silicate or two, and a few other phases, but about a dozen phases in all. And we call these the Ur minerals, these very refractory materials that are basically synthesized as micro and nano phases in the envelopes of an exploding star. 
And so the central question of mineralogy, of mineral evolution, can be phrased as how do you go from a dozen ur minerals to the 4,500 or so species that are known on Earth today? So, what drives mineral evolution? There are various deterministic processes that are going to occur on any terrestrial planet or moon. And the first, very important, has to do with just the selection and concentration of elements. There are lots of trace and minor elements that are widely dispersed in the early universe and through particularly fluid rock interactions and various heating and cooling cycles, you therefore concentrate, select, and isolate into more and more concentrated volumes, and that's how you get mineral diversification. That's one way. A second is that as you get larger and larger planets, you get new ranges of intensive variables, um, temperature, pressure, activities, the volatiles, and so forth. And finally, and surprisingly, most importantly for mineral diversification, it's the influence of life. And what we'll see is that and one of the central take-home messages of this talk is that two-thirds of the mineral diversity on Earth is a consequence of biology. So, we divide Earth history into three eras, further subdivide that into ten stages, and so for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to go through these ten stages and give you a sense of Earth's increasing complexification in terms of its mineral realm. The first is the era of planetary accretion, what's preserved in meteorites. The second is the era of crust and mantle reworking, including things like granitization and the initiation of plate tectonics. And then finally, the era of biomediated mineralogy, which is by far the greatest pulse of mineral diversity comes during this stage. So stage one, the first stage after the Ur minerals, you have a planetary nebula, you, the sun, has collected 99.9% .9 of the mass, mostly hydrogen and helium. There's the disk of dust and gas surrounding that. And then the sun ignites. It goes through its T tauri phases. Intense pulses of heat radiate out. They bake, they melt, they process that dust and gas. And you form these little droplets called chondrules. And so the most primitive of all the meteorites, the chondrite meteorites, contain a variety of phases that we've never seen before. So this is 4.567 uh, billion years ago, roughly. And there are various minerals, about 60 in all. So here, through those first pulses of heating, we go from 12 up to 60. Now the chondrites in stage two start coalescing, accreting, forming planetesimals. And in the planetesimals, you have new mineral forming processes. You have aqueous interactions with the rock. You have heating and melting. You have differentiation of those planetesimals. And you have shock impacts. And so you form a new series of minerals. The first alkali feldspars, for example. First significant amounts of silica minerals and, and other minerals that are well known to us. First micas would occur at this period and clay minerals occurring in some abundance. And this takes you up to about the 250, maybe even 300 mineral species that are found today in the meteorites that fall to Earth. All of those different achondrites, what are basically blasted off fragments of planetesimals that have disintegrated and we're sampling um, like pieces of a cadaver, we're seeing different slices and fragments of the past of those bodies. So this gives us now from 12 to 60 to 250. And this is the starting point of building planets like Earth. So the second era is the crust and mantle reworking. Stage three, it's just basic igneous petrology. It's what Norman Bowen described in the evolution of the igneous rocks. It uses phase equilibria of the classic type that we've all learned about. And there is then a process, which Bowen pointed out, for example, of the continuous feldspar series of mineral evolution and also the discontinuous series going from um, olivines to pyroxenes to amphiboles to micas in the mafic minerals. And we see this sequence over and over again. This is a kind of mineral diversification that occurs deterministically on any terrestrial planet or moon, at least any in a solar system that has a composition similar to ours. Now, if you have a volatile poor body, something like Mercury or the moon, we estimate this gets you up to about 350 different minerals, 300 different phases, and that's about it. It's very hard to see how a small body that does not have a huge amount of internal heat, lots of reworking, lots of aqueous alteration can go farther than this. 
So we think this is the end point of the moon and of Mercury. If you have volatiles, however, there are lots of other things that can happen. You get volcanism, you get outgassing, you start get surface hydration, you start forming lots of interesting things, evaporites, you can get ices, and of course various types of hydrates like clay minerals and so forth. And we think this gets you up to about 500 different mineral species on a volatile bearing terrestrial planet. Now, in the case of Earth, we had a rather large impact early in the history, maybe after about 30 million years. That impact of Theia was uh, violent. Everything was molten at the surface. Basically, all the minerals that had existed on Earth up to that point, anything in the near surface environment disappeared. It was like a giant reset button. And then that reset button takes you right back to 500. This is a deterministic process. And so very quickly, whether it's a million years or 10 million years, I'm not sure. But fairly quickly, you get back to this. And that's stage three on a volatile rich body. If you have enough volume, enough internal heat, you may be able to go beyond this. But we think Mars probably did not. So we think Mars is a mineralogically fairly limited world, maybe about 500 different mineral species. And it's hard to imagine how you get beyond this. But stage four, if you have a larger body, then you can partially melt basalt. Significant volumes of partially melted basalt yields granite. And more importantly, it yields pegmatites. So you start getting fluid rock interactions at a much larger scale. And there are roughly 500 minerals that are unique to pegmatites. These are the late stage fluids that concentrate, select, concentrate, and precipitate out those rare minerals. So minerals of, of boron and lithium, of beryllium, of tantalum of cesium. Polyocytes are amazing. It's, it's a cesium silicate. Uh, and cesium is an incredible rare element, a part per trillion in the crust. And yet, here you can get crystals that are the size of your fist of this pure cesium silicate. That's a process of selecting and concentrating. And the key thing here is that it, it takes multiple cycles of eutectic melting and concentrating these rare elements to do this. So it means it takes a long time. And one of the discoveries, if you will, the early discoveries of mineral evolution is that many minerals that are cherished and valued today could not have occurred in Earth's first billion or billion and a half years. Here, for example, is a plot made by Ed Grew and myself of all the known minerals of beryllium. There's something about like 106 different minerals. And what this shows on the horizontal scale is the age before present going back three and a half billion years. 3 billion years, excuse me, and on the vertical scale, just, just the first appearance, cumulative number of beryllium minerals that had appeared at our surface based on known outcrops today. And what you see here is that there were no known beryllium minerals in rocks older than 3 billion years. We have no evidence from rocks in the, in prior to 3 billion years that beryllium had gotten sufficiently concentrated that pegmatites could form and produce those barrel minerals. And there are only a handful of beryllium minerals for another 500 million years or even a billion years. And then you see pulses of beryllium mineralization, which as I'll show you later, are related to the supercontinent cycle. So, so this is intriguing to see how this works. We've done the same kind of analysis for boron minerals, which you see here in darker blue. And actually a very similar pattern. There are some boron minerals that are slightly over. Tourmaline appears in slightly older rocks. But you don't see real acceleration of the production of different of boron minerals until um, really the last 500 million years. And that's partly because just of a preservation problem. So this kind of graph had never been produced before. And there are lots of subtleties in here, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. OK, that's stage four, granitization. Stage five, and as far as you know, Earth is the only planet that's gotten to stage five, is when plate tectonics kicks in. And the key thing with plate tectonics is that you're reprocessing huge volume of the crust and upper mantle through subduction, and then fluids that work their way back up to the surface and the volcanism that's associated with that. This is where you basically can process millions of cubic kilometers of Earth 
through fluid rock interactions. And that can extract huge amounts of trace and minor elements. It leads to all kinds of new materials, not only new modes of volcanism, but you get uh, these massive base metal deposits and all the associated sulfur salts, hundreds of new minerals that never occurred before as a result of these interactions. Um, we also, because of subduction and isostatic rebound, you get uh, ultra-high pressure metamorphic terrains and other new minerals that wouldn't have occurred before. So really, there are lots of different processes that plate tectonics gives you, and this leads to up to about 1,500 different mineral species. So 1,500, we've gone from 12 to 60 to 250 to 350 or 500, depending on the volatiles, 1,000. Now we're up to 1,500 in stage 5. And we would argue that Venus may have progressed part of the way to this, although Venus sort of took a right turn when um, it, it went to its uh, greenhouse, its, its runaway greenhouse effect. The surface can no longer sustain clay minerals, for example, because it's just simply too hot. But it's interesting to think about Venus and compare it to Earth in terms of this mineral evolution. Now, um, at this point, we're at 1,500 minerals. And try as we could, we could not think of any mechanism by which you could get substantially increased mineral diversity on an Earth-like planet as it existed prior to life. So now we come to this era of biomediated mineralogy. And an interesting point here is that lots of the origin of life scenarios seem to require some mineral degree of mineral evolution. There are arguments that sulfides may have played an important role or clay minerals. Borates, um, Helen Hansen is here, she's argued that micas could play an important role. So, so some mineral template or, or a way to concentrate and select the organic molecules and, and jumpstart life. This has been proposed many, many times. But intriguingly, it looks like mineral evolution itself, the diversification of minerals, may then depend on the origin of life. And that's what I really mean when I'm talking about the coevolution of the geosphere and the biosphere, the living world. So, stage six. And this takes us back now to the origin of life, perhaps four billion years ago, perhaps 3.5, something in that range. And those earliest microbes took advantage of redox couples at or near Earth's surface. For example, iron oxidation reduction, sulfur, sulfide sulfate couples, that sort of thing. And what microbes did in those earliest days, as near as we know, these were not photosynthetic organisms that jump-started reactions that wouldn't otherwise occur. They basically were just taking advantage of the chemical energy was already there. They were acting as essentially catalysts to speed up those reactions and get that little boost of energy. And that's how microbes made a living. As a consequence, we don't see a lot of new and original minerals rising from biology before photosynthesis. What we see is a redistribution of minerals at or near Earth's surface in the form of things like banded iron formations, in the formation of, of carbonate stromatolites, some phosphate deposits, and so forth, things that clearly show the signs of life but not showing any novel minerals. You also have um, more sulfates. You change the distribution of sulfur minerals at or near surface. Um, and maybe you have interesting scarns because if you have more carbonates as the result of life and they're metamorphosed, then you form the scar minerals and more abundance. So all of these just, it's a change in the distribution of minerals, not in the number of different minerals per se. We're still at 1,500. Uh, but then stage seven. And stage seven is where the action really happens in Earth history. This is the great oxidation event this period which is roughly estimated to be from about 2.4 to 2.2 billion years ago when Earth's near-surface environment suddenly had a substantial amount of oxygen in the atmosphere but also in the near-surface environment. And this is the result of oxidative photosynthesis, oxygenic photosynthesis, which produced huge amounts of banded iron formations, massive manganese deposits, and in fact, we argue that relatively soon after this, although the timing, as you'll see, remains somewhat of a debate, relatively soon, you went from 1,500 to over 4,000 different minerals as a result of near-surface oxidation. It really has to do with the fact that oxygen 
interacts with the near surface environment and produces a whole suite of phases that wouldn't be there before. And so our hypothesis is that roughly two thirds of all the mineral species at Earth's surface are the result, the indirect consequence of biological activity. And there are lots of lines of evidence. And because this is such an important part of our thesis, I want to take you through some of the geochemical reasoning that leads us to this idea. Now, you've probably all seen diagrams something like this. On the horizontal scale is time before present with four and a half billion years on the left and modern times on the right. The vertical scale is a logarithmic scale of the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere compared to uh, present levels. This is in percent. So what you see here is a very characteristic curve where before about 2.4 billion years, you had very little oxygen. It doesn't say how much, but it, this, this scale shows it as something like a 10,000th of a percent or something like that. Then you had about 1% of modern levels for a while, and then a big jump roughly 600 or 700 million years ago to more or less modern levels. What this diagram doesn't tell you is what exactly is the lower limit for before the great oxidation event. There are a lot of different suggestions out there that have been proposed. So Hiroshi Emoto is kind of an outlier. He says there's been oxygen in the atmosphere, molecular oxygen throughout its history. Uh, most people don't agree with that. Uh, you get evidence from sulfur isotopes, evidence from uh, various cobbles in ancient stream beds that show very little weathering or erosion, and, and other arguments from geochemistry that the atmosphere had to be much less than 10 to the minus 5 atmospheres. There is a model of atmosphere chemistry that says that water molecules rising high into the atmosphere bathed in ultraviolet radiation will dissociate. They'll dissociate into oxygen plus hydrogen. The hydrogen can escape, meaning there's always early in Earth's history going to be this background level of molecular oxygen, which then can interact with the surface. And then Dmitry Svrjensky and, and myself and our colleagues are arguing that the effective near surface redox the effective partial pressure of oxygen or fugacity of oxygen, if you like to think of it that way, is something less than 10 to the minus 70th. Okay, that's a big difference. 10 to the minus 70th means that there is absolutely no molecular oxygen at all, not a single molecule. Now, we accept the fact that in the atmosphere, it may be 10 to the minus 13, but even a millimeter below the surface, it's 10 to the minus 70 or below. There's simply not enough molecular oxygen to do anything. There's so much ferrous iron in the near surface environment at this point. You simply cannot have any molecular oxygen. And so here's some of the observations people have made. And I want to go through these and look at their implications in terms of geochemical calculations. You find in ancient stream bed sediments detrital uraninite and pyrite that are unweathered, that are still shiny and round, meaning they haven't weathered at all. You find paleosols lacking any iron oxides, meaning the iron oxide has been stripped out in some soluble form. You find surface waters that have divalent iron, unlike today. You find surface waters with extremely low sulfate, probably high sulfide in some of these times. You find europium anomalies that suggest there has been a selective um, enhancement of europium in its two-valent as opposed to three-valent state. And if you look at what these mean on a diagram that shows pH on the horizontal scale and oxygen fugacity or partial pressure of oxygen on the vertical scale, in a log scale, I think the results are clear. First of all, think about pH in the early oceans. There, there's some debate, but it's going to be s sort of neutral, around seven, maybe six, maybe something like that. So look in the schedule. Well, the first thing you notice is that the hematite magnetite buffers the entire system at 10 to the minus 72. And I really could stop talking right there because uh, you had so much ferrous iron around that if there's any molecular oxygen at all, it's immediately going to react and be buffered at hematite magnetite. That's what you see in banded iron formations. The near surface environment is buffered at 10 to the minus 72. No molecular oxygen. But there's lots of other evidence, too. The fact that uraninite doesn't 
dissolve or, or erode indicates that you're somehow below uh, 10 to the minus um, 62 and a half. The fact that you have sulfide exceeding sulfate means that you're somewhere below 10 to the minus 70. The fact that divalent europium is present actually pegs things more like 10 to the minus 78. These are all consistent with an extremely anoxic environment. Let's look at the precipitation of ferroin carbonates, siderite, anchorite, which we know are present in these early deposits. Well, this is 1965 science. This is stuff from Garrels and Christ. Uh, many of you may remember that textbook if you took aqueous geochemistry. And if you saw diagrams like this, again, on the horizontal scale, here we have the partial pressure of CO2, and on the vertical scale, partial pressure of oxygen with the, the, the bottom scale at, at 10 to the minus 100 uh, a log scale. And so where does the carbonate form? The carbonate, uh, iron carbonates form in this region. You have to have modestly high CO2, higher partial pressures than are experienced today. And if you look at this close up, you see that means you have to have the partial pressure of oxygen below 10 to the minus 68. Ferroin carbonates do not form above 10 to the minus 68. Therefore, the fact that we see ferroin carbonates in these early rocks suggests there's an extremely low partial pressure of oxygen. Now, in spite of these lines of evidence, um, there's some very prominent articles out there that like to talk about early whiffs of oxygen. This is sort of sexy stuff that gets you published in Nature. And this particular Ann Bard All article from 2007 was pointing out that in the 2.5 billion year old Mount McRae Shale in Australia, this is a black shale that represents an offshore marine black shale sediment, that there's a period an interval of a few meters here where there's an enhancement of molybdenum and rhenium in that black shale. And the fact is molybdenum and rhenium in their more oxidized forms become mobilized. And so therefore the argument here was there must have been a whiff of oxygen to mobilize the molybdenum and rhenium to deposit them then through the erosion process into the black shales and then that was preserved. Notice, however, there's no enhancement at all of uranium here. So there's no mobilization of uranium at the same time that molybdenum and rhenium are mobilized. Now, so what does this mean? What can we argue here? Certainly this is telling us something about near surface conditions. So here's a diagram, much like the one I showed you before, pH on the horizontal scale. So keep focusing on more or less the, the intermediate pHs, 6 to 8. And on the vertical scales, the log fugacity, or, or think of it as partial pressure of oxygen. Again, going from minus 80 up to minus 40. The fact that we have molybdenum mobilized simply means that you're someplace below 10 to the minus 66. The fact that you have a molybdenum or rhenium mobilized simply means you're below about 10 to the minus 62. The fact that you don't have uranium mobilized suggests that the effective subsurface uh, log FO2 is something well below this 10 to the minus 50. So, yeah, you, you, this may be a whiff of electron acceptor. It may be a whiff of sulfate. It may be a whiff of nitrate. Maybe a whiff of, who knows, it's not a whiff of oxygen. There is no molecular oxygen here. Okay, so what does that mean? What does that mean? The implication here is that during this period, the effective partial pressure of oxygen is less than 10 to the minus 60, probably close to the buffering of 10 to the minus 72. So let's look at some of our favorite minerals. And for me, those beautiful copper minerals that you find in museums, the blue and green vivid minerals like malachite and azurite fit the bill. Okay, here's another diagram, 1965, Garrels and Christ. This is known science. We're not inventing anything new here. Partial pressure of CO2, maybe, um, you know, a hundredth of an atmosphere at that point. And in order to make stable azurite or malachite, you have to be greater than 10 to the minus 42. Azurite and malachite form in subsurface aqueous environments where you have somewhat oxidizing 
fluids, there's some kind of electron acceptor down there. It ain't molecular oxygen, and if your s effective subsurface is buffered by hematite magnetite at 10 to the minus 72, you're never going to form azurite or malachite. You're 30 log units away from azurite and malachite. And you can go through the same reasoning and see mineral after mineral. 256 of the 321 known copper minerals could not form. And you can go through this list. 90% of the known uranium minerals wouldn't form. Most of the manganese minerals, the nickel minerals, the iron minerals, the cobalt minerals, you can go down the list. They simply can't form. There's no environment in the near surface earth that is sufficiently oxidizing to make these minerals stable. You have to have a subsurface oxidized fluid, a fluid rich in electron acceptors. And that only happens well after the great oxidation event, which is a direct consequence of biology. Now, people say, oh, yes, but Mars is a red planet. Look at the oxidized surface. That's hematite. And if you took the total amount of oxygen in Mars's atmosphere and condensed it down, do the math, it's a one micron coating. So talking a kilometer or half a kilometer beneath the surface, there is no molecular oxygen. You cannot form these minerals. And that's why we say that two-thirds of the known minerals on Earth today are an indirect consequence of biology. Stage eight, intermediate ocean, sometimes called the boring billion, because here's a billion years of Earth history where suddenly things just shut down. It seems like there are very few changes. There are no ice ages. It's very hard to identify any major changes in biological systems. And basically, the idea here, it's sometimes been called the period of the Canfield Ocean, when you basically, you can think of it as a, as a period when the ocean, because the ocean's volume is so vast compared to the atmosphere, uh, you know, it's 250 times the mass of the atmosphere. So it takes a long time, even if you've oxygenated with 1% of current levels oxygen in the atmosphere, it takes a long time to oxygenate and get rid of the ferrous iron to really kind of change the ocean chemistry. And so that billion year period is essentially a billion year period of, of a buffer, we think. So you still had about 4,000 mineral species, maybe not a lot of novelty. I say that, but then suddenly you look at the data and, and, and something's interesting here. Here, for example, is that plot I showed you earlier of beryllium mineralization. And those are the number of beryllium minerals almost triples during this boring period. That pulse of beryllium mineralization doesn't occur right at the great oxidation event, nor, nor should it. So and if you look, there are major ore deposits during this period. There's some really inter interesting things going on, probably related to the supercontinent cycle during this period. And so we're still trying to learn about this. I don't think the boring billion is all that boring anymore. But that remains to be seen. Stage nine, the snowball Earth. You go from this period of a billion years of essential stasis in the near-Earth environment to these wild fluctuations between a snowball or a slush ball Earth to a hothouse Earth back and forth maybe three times, cycling over a period just a few hundred million years. A great rise in atmospheric oxidation at the same time. And this is reflected not in any substantially new number of minerals. We still think we're, uh, you know, 4,000 plus but you do see a different distribution, for example, in the deposits of huge aragonite crystals on the ocean floor during periods when you swing from ice house to, to hot house. Um, so a few new species. And then finally, we get from uh, stage nine, this, this glacial period. Oh, I should say there is one major change in the near surface mineralogy, and that's ice. Suddenly you have a lot of ice, which is in mineral, so. So that would be one dramatic change. Um, and then stage 10, this is the Phanerozoic period of biomineralization of the terrestrial biosphere. This is the first time in Earth's history when Earth looks like an Earth-like planet. I, I'm always fascinated when people talk about Kepler. Oh, we're going to find Earth-like planets. And I say, what do you mean by an Earth-like planet? And most people, especially if they haven't thought about it, well, you know, a planet just like Earth. Well, Earth's only been an Earth-like planet for the last 8% of its history. If, if you mean this by an Earth-like planet. So, so just bear that in mind. Before this time, you would have had a tough time surviving in, in any sense for the previous 92% of Earth history. 
Anyway, so there's a lot of interesting things happen during this period. This is when we get up to the modern number of minerals. You get a lot of biomineralization with carbonates and silica, uh, various other biominerals being deposited and really transforming the near surface look of Earth because of new minerals that are being formed through biological interactions. Okay, what are the implications of mineral evolution? First is that you can classify, you can contrast and compare various terrestrial planets and moons. So we have Mercury and the moon, which may be stopped at 350 different minerals because they're dry and they're small. You have Mars, which was not dry and therefore maybe got up to 500 minerals, but it's still small. It doesn't have enough internal heat. You have Venus, which was certainly large enough to produce granites. I'll bet you there are pegmatites on Venus because there's basalt, and if you melt basalt, you produce granites. And then there's Earth, the living world, where you get up to 4,500 species as a result of the biological activities. And of course, this gives us then mineralogical targets for NASA to be thinking about when they're exploring other worlds. What are the key things we want to look for? Well, we want to look for biosignatures and maybe a biosignatures, that is, mineralogical signs that life hadn't occurred there. So, you know, if you find banded iron formations or maybe turquoise, that would tell you something. I think what we need to look for are the larger formations. And to me, you know, I'd love to know if on Mars there are any granites or particularly pegmatites. Are there any massive sulfide deposits? What would that tell us about the fluid rock interactions that's occurring deeper within the planet? Carbonates, really important thing. And of course, people know this. People are looking for these things. You know, banded iron formations would be amazing to find. And we've already found evaporites. So, so that's the kind of thing we should be looking for at the near surface that might have spectral signatures that we can view from some distance. There's another important reason to think about mineral evolution, and that's from a pedagogical standpoint. As I say, mineralogy has fallen on hard times, and it's partly our own fault. Because we still, if you go to a museum, you look at a hand specimen, there's a pretty crystal there. It'll give you a chemical formula. It might give you the location. What's its story? What is the story? How old is the specimen? Have you ever gone to a museum and seen a quartz crystal and said, here's a quartz crystal that's, that's 435 million years old? They don't talk about the historical context. And what mineral evolution gives you is a way to talk about mineralogy with this incredible narrative thrust that the whole story of the Earth from, from its formation in a nebula and its differentiation and the triggering of, of you know, the basaltic veneers and granite and plate tectonics and the origin of life and the evolution of life and the terrestrial biosphere and supercontinent cycles and all these things come into play. And it's all illustrated by the minerals. The minerals have a story to tell, and, and so the narrative power of mineral evolution, to me, is incredibly important. And then there are people who say, oh, but we have to teach crystal chemistry, and we have to teach petrology, and we have to teach all these things. How is that going to work? Well, look at the 12 Ur minerals. Rather than having to artificially sandwich in things like covalent and metallic bonding and some of the other things, if you look at the Ur minerals, all the major types of chemical bonding are there in those first 12 minerals. Polymorphism is there. All the different kinds of physical properties you'd ever want to talk about are there. And other things, the different major cation polyhedra, from silicate tetrahedra to uh, magnesium octahedron, phase equilibria can be shown, solid solution. I mean, let, let's face it, we've got spinel there, the classic original case of, of solid solution and ordered disorder is there as well. So, this is a tremendous opportunity. You can bring in all of those key topics that the mineralogists want to talk about integrally right at the beginning and then refer back to them as the different characters, the different players, as the feldspars and the micas and the silica minerals come in at various points in Earth history and they become part of this narrative, part of the story. You see that evolution occurring. Okay, so that's a framework. And some of you might be thinking, yeah, okay, so what? What does this tell us that's new? Is there anything new here? And I think there is, and I want to share with you some very recent data which shows you the kinds of things that are lurking, I believe, in the mineralogical record which we've never looked for before. Let's begin with molybdenite. Okay, molybdenite is the commonest mineral 
of molybdenum, molybdenum disulfide. It occurs all over the world. There are thousands of locations. And so what we did is we said, well, molybdenum is one of those minerals that it can incorporate rhenium, it can incorporate tungsten, it can incorporate other trace and minor elements. And perhaps if the subsurface environment changes in its oxidation state, you'll see pulses of new trace and minor elements coming in simply because they're mobilized in this subsurface environment. So here's a plot that Melissa McMillan, an undergraduate intern, made just doing analyses of various molybdenites. She actually analyzed about 70 molybdenites that expanded back to um, about three billion years ago. So against, again, we have, uh, on this case, age on the horizontal scale, but uh, sadly, there's no convention here. We've got to get a convention. So here, three billion years is all the way over on the right. Modern time is all the way over on the left. On the vertical scale is the trace concentration of tungsten in molybdenites. She found is that the only molybdenites that have uh, a thousand part per million or more, and there's actually more data since we've done this, are from the last 1.1 billion years. So we have molybdenites that extend all the way back to roughly 3 billion years, but they don't have these high levels of tungsten. Well, tungsten is one of the elements that's mobilized when it's oxidized. In its four valence state, it's immobile. As soon as it goes to the six valence state, it becomes soluble and therefore can move and perhaps then be incorporated into the molybdenite ores. Similar thing with rhenium. Rhenium in its four valence state is insoluble, but in its seven valence state, it's mobilized. And again, it can be incorporated directly into molybdenite. And here we see again, in the last 1.1 million billion years, this is when we see these higher levels of rhenium. This is admittedly preliminary data. There's, we need to do a lot more samples. And if any of you have access to molybdenite samples or have access to their trace and minor element chemistry, we'd love to know that. But this preliminary intriguing uh, result is, I think, very suggestive. And we've been working with a statistician who says, yes, these are highly significant results. If you look at all the data we have, this, this difference between the last billion years and the previous period of time is, is real and significant, and it actually bears out the hypothesis that we had. Okay, I've mentioned a couple times the supercontinent cycle. And here's a case looking at zircons through time. This is not our data. This is the data Hawksworth has done some of this. Condi has done some of these compilations. And you just take lots and lots and lots of little zircon crystals from various formations, and you see what their ages are. And you might expect there'd be some nice distribution coming up with more specimens of the present, but that's not what you see. You see pulses of zircon formation, and those pulses correspond to the formation of different supercontinents. The idea being that when you have collisions of continents and orogenies, that's where you get the granite formation, the remobilization of zircon, and the formation of lots of zircon crystals. We have been looking at mercury mineral evolution. The, there are about 100 known minerals of the element mercury. And what we find, first of all, just looking on this, this graph, it's a little hard to see from the back, I'm sure, but this is just mercury mineral localities. So you basically go in the database mindat.org. It lists thousands of localities of mercury. We've gotten a large representative sample of those from around the world. We've looked at the ages of the mercury mineralization, not the host rock, but the mercury mineralization itself, and plotted them. And you see that they're pulses of mercury mineralization. And again, they seem to roughly correlate with the formation of some of the supercontinents. And if you look now at the appearance of new mercury minerals, so this is just the first earliest, oldest appearance of minerals. And so the first one there uh, at about 3.1 billion years is cinnabar. That's mercury sulfide. And then other mercury minerals have, have appeared at various points. And again, there's a striking correlation to a point with the supercontinent cycle. That is, when you're, when you're assembling these supercontinents, and that's what those black bars show, you're getting erogenies, and what you're doing is, is two continents come together. The marine black shales, which are sandwiched in between as the continents come together, they're reprocessed, and the reprocessing of the re marine black shales, that's where a lot of the mercury is concentrated. It, it basically attaches to organic material. It's been buried, and that, we think, causes the new pulses of mercury mineralization. So you see these three episodes, Kennerland, Columbia, and Pangaea, 
But what you see is striking in the zircon data is rhodinia has a very strong pulse of zircons, but no mercury minerals. No localities to speak of for a 1.2 billion year span of Earth history. And this is not just sort of a, a hiatus in our data. We've, we've looked, you know, we've looked for areas around the world where there are rocks of this age. You just don't see mercury mineralization. And we have a hypothesis why this might be true. If you have a sulfitic ocean, the least soluble of all the sulfides is mercury sulfide. Cinnabar, you form nanoparticles. It settles to the bottom. It's basically locked up. And as long as you have a sulfitic ocean, which is what this one billion year period, the boring billion is supposed to have had, we suggest maybe mercury was sequestered very quickly and therefore it was not nearly as easy to liberate into mercury deposits. I mean, this is, this is like a new idea and we'd love to get some feedback. We're trying to try to understand what this hiatus means, but it's there. And to show you how real it is, this is a comparison now of what we saw before in blue is the beryllium plot that I showed you before compared to the mercury plot. And this is, again, the cumulative mineral diversity, the first appearance of each mineral up to the 90-some known mercury minerals or the 106 known beryllium minerals. You see throughout that period pulses of beryllium mineralization during the assembly of Columbia, during the assembly of Rodini and so forth, you just don't see the same thing in the mercury plot. So why should mercury be so different? Why this 1.2 billion year interval when you don't get mercury mineralization? It's, it's a really intriguing point. We see other trends too. The formation of Pangaea saw a more than doubling of the number of known mercury minerals. This also is a period because of the terrestrial biosphere of a tremendous sequestration of organic carbon. And we know that mercury its cycle is tied very closely to the organic carbon cycle. So we wonder if this correlation might not be very important too, that there were new, uh, very efficient ways of burying and then reprocessing mercury. Mercury bound to organic carbon, unlike sulfide, is very mobilized. So it's possible to concentrate it, bury it, and then remobilize it. And maybe that's why we see this great pulse of new mercury minerals at the time of the Pangaea supercontinent. So it's that interval we're looking at, and it's really intriguing that you, you more than double the number of mercury minerals in an interval of just about 150 million years. That's a, that's a, and you do not see similar pulses right after that. So there's a long hiatus during when Pangaea was a stable continent. You see basically no mercury mineralization and then quite a bit of mineralization just in the recent years. That's mostly ephemeral minerals that are mercury halides that are soluble so that if it rains, they disappear. Okay, so there's so much work to be done. We've been looking at clay mineral evolution. Uh, we have a paper that looks not only at mercury, but bromium and iodine mineralization, um, molybdenum and tungsten, fascinating story. The idea of carbonates, and you'll see some of the collaborators on these, the, the lead authors on them. Um, phosphoric and phosphorus and arsenic, um, lithium, beryllium, and boron that Ed Grew has been working on at the University of Maine. And we are fascinated by the prospect of looking at huge databases where we can look at the change of trace in minor elements and things like micas and amphiboles and garnets and spinels because we anticipate, again, that these are going to be, the trace and minor elements are going to be tremendous indicators of changes in geochemical environment through time. And just the idea of looking at a thousand amphibole or tourmaline crystals at their trace element compositions through time, it, it, it's a daunting challenge. A lot of that data is already out there, just needs to be compiled, and who knows what we're going to find. We also want to identify mineralogical targets for astrobiology work and work closely with the people who are designing uh, remote and lander type vehicles. Um, I think there's a uh, opportunity here to develop new databases where minerals are not just listed as a bunch of species, but each locality and the ages of the localities is, is cataloged. And so therefore data mining would be possible in a much more efficient way. Um, so we're now in the process of our ambition is to get 100,000 mineral localities and the ages of the minerals that occur within them. 
And it's a big project, but the paleontological community has done something even more ambitious than that in terms of their databases, so we think it's possible. And then you can automatically look at species and locality distributions through time and produce diagrams, the type I have here, but with much less bias in terms of sampling. So, my conclusions, and they're, um, I think, pretty basic in the types of, types of things, the way, the way we think about mineralogy. We clearly see that terrestrial planets and moons achieve different stages of mineral evolution, from the mineralogical simplicity of the moon and Mercury to the diversity that we find on Earth. We see that different planets and moons achieve this through stochastic and deterministic means. The different worlds may diverge in their paths at some point. And that's a fascinating thing to think about. If we start, start thinking about Kepler and the thousands and thousands of Earth-like planets, and I mean that literally Earth-like planets that they may be finding, do we see divergences in the mineral evolution? We see that there are three principal mechanisms of mineral evolution. One is the selection and concentration of elements. Second is the increase in the ranges of temperature, pressure, and composition where minerals can form. And finally, it's the role of living systems that play such a fundamental role on Earth's mineral diversification. And so my final conclusion is that with mineral evolution, the science of mineralogy once again assumes its rightful place at the center of the Earth and planetary sciences. With that, I thank you and I welcome questions. So then at the beginning, the elements were all there, but they were just in sort of more homogeneous sort of mess or something before they got concentrated and segregated? Yes, I think this is one of the most fascinating things to think about. In those pre-solar grains, you have the complete periodic table of the stable elements, the geochemical elements. There are 80 plus elements that play a role, uh, non-radioactive elements that play a role in geology, and they were all there. The beryllium was there, the cesium was there, the, the boron and the lithium and, and the mercury were there. But they did not form their own phases. They were dispersed. And the question is, where were those elements? This is a question, were they at grain boundaries? Were there some kinds of nano phases that we just haven't recognized yet? Were they in solid solution and other phases? Well, there are a lot of incompatible elements that just don't have a comfortable home in those 12 Ur minerals. So there has to be something else. There were glasses, maybe they're just just don't crystallize. They form amorphous phases. And it, but that's the neat thing. When you look at a chondrite, there are only 60 different minerals that have been identified in chondrite meteorites. Well, those chondrites contain the complete periodic table of geochemically relevant elements. They're all there. And so somehow it's the processing from that chondrite with its 60 different minerals to the modern world we see today. That's really the story of mineral evolution. I appreciated your thought about how we could teach mineralogy in the different context of, of long-term evolution of the Earth. And I'm curious if there's anything out there that you or your colleagues have put together in terms of resources for you know, young professors or for people out there who, in terms of uh, PowerPoints and other, uh, other sort of materials that one could, could, could start with in terms of teaching. Thanks for that. Um, we do have an issue of elements, which some of you may know is a, uh, it's a bi-monthly periodical that, that covers aspects of science with more illustrated popular articles. I have a Scientific American article out. We have, my PowerPoints are all available on my website. But in terms of a curriculum at this point, no, I have heard of one textbook that's being written in France. This particular idea has really caught on in Europe, largely because they do still have mineralogy departments and they're feeling it's harder and harder to defend their relevance. Um, and if I can share a story with you, this is something that was quite moving to me. One of the very first lectures I gave on this subject, which was really the same month that the article appeared, was at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, right across the street from the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. 
And it was an audience about like this. And while I was lecturing, I noticed there was a gentleman in the back, much older than the students who had attended, who began to weep as I lectured, <laughs> which is not necessarily a good sign. <laughs> but he, he was deeply moved. And he came up afterwards and said, he introduced himself. He was the curator of mineralogy at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And he told me that just that week, the director of the museum had taken him aside and said, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to give away the mineral collection and disband your position because we've changed our focus. We are going to become a museum of evolution. <laughs> and he said, now you've changed my whole vision of what my role is and how I can rationalize and justify my position. I haven't found out what happened to him. and <laughs> I don't know what happened to the mineral collection, but it is certainly true now that you can see mineralogy in a much broader context, in a context of, of, of life too. And this feedback, these feedbacks are astonishing. And so I think it does give us a tremendous opportunity not just to integrate mineralogy with the rest of earth science, but integrate mineralogy with a much broader range of intellectual pursuits. I'd love to see a good textbook do that. I see a couple of questions back there, one up here. You spoke of the uh, relatively small number of minerals uh, on the moon as a uh, function of the small amount of water, the moon being dry. Uh, would you care to comment on the recent studies indicating from magmatic inclusions that the mantle of the moon may have as much water as that of the Earth. Indeed, and it's certainly true that the discoveries, for example, by Eric Howery, my colleague at Carnegie, have found um, that rather than the very sparse sort of few part per million of water, the lunar glasses, those little beads that you find, if you slice them open, you find 100 parts per million water at their cores and given the rate of diffusion and loss of, of water, it's estimated there could have been six or seven hundred parts per million water during those magmatic explosive eruptions, which must have been driven by some volatiles. So indeed, there must have been some volatiles. What I think the moon lacks is a very dynamic mechanism of fluid circulation through a series of cracks and fissures and pores, the kind of fluid circulation that characterizes Earth's near surface environment. So even if there are fluid inclusions or little local pockets, and maybe there is some local, you know, maybe you form a little amphibole crystal here or there when you have a little pocket of water, that's very possible. Um, but it's, it's really dry in terms of the kinds of near surface environment, the kinds of processes that on Earth le leads to abundant clays, leads to abundant amphiboles and micas and that sort of thing. Uh, just as a casual observer, I just wanted to ask, uh, from the beginning I wasn't sure whether you were measuring time by the contents of rocks or were you measuring the contents of rocks by time? I don't want to ask you to go through the whole thing again, but could you answer that? Our th we like to think of it as a historical narrative. So in that sense, we're just looking from the formation of the Earth 4.567 billion years ago as a series of stages to the present. So that really is a timeline in years. And then seeing as you look at different periods of Earth's history, when new minerals come in. Now admittedly, and I kind of glossed over this, some of these stages overlap with other stages and that can lead to confusion. Granitization is still going on today. Plate tectonics is still going on today. The igneous processes. So, so whereas stage one and two, the formation of those meteorites, really is something that was characteristic of the very primitive early solar system. Stages three, four, and five, were things that have been continuous through time and continue to produce minerals on Earth today. And if you go to the article that, that I mentioned, there's a much more explicit discussion of those timelines. So, so that can lead to confusion. But these are steps, there are stages that came into play at different points in Earth history. Does that sort of answer? Oh, okay. The, 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 and I did make that assumption that there's a, there's a field called geochronology where one can take 
um, rocks and minerals, and if they contain, for example, certain radioactive elements, the decay rates, the known decay rates of those elements provide kind of an internal clock. So, for example, I mentioned zircon crystals. Zircon crystals can incorporate tiny amounts of uranium. And so when the zircon crystal forms, it may have a few tens or hundreds parts per million of uranium. But the half-life of that uranium is about four and a half billion years. So if a zircon crystal has been around for four billion or so years, half of the uranium has converted to lead. And you measure the ratio of uranium to lead, and it actually gives you an internal clock. And that's, that's how we date rocks. That's how the geochronologists do it. There are some other techniques as well, but the main ones have to do with this called radiometric dating, and, and the ages I was using are ones that are extracted from the literature based on that kind of dating. Any other questions? <clears throat> you finally made mineralogy interesting, uh, and, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for that. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the 12 ur minerals are, are probably one of the most interesting things I heard today. Uh, but I missed why you call them ur. Oh. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I'd like to know something about the properties of these minerals and why wasn't maybe the next mineral excluded from that group. There must be something about the structure of these things that's, that's very special and, and unique to these, four, uh, to these 12 uh, minerals. I, I, I love the way you phrase your question, and I, I really appreciate that, and thank you for it, because that's really one of the things we're trying to do, um, is, is make mineralogy interesting, because these are objects that are intrinsically fascinating, and yet somehow they've lost their appeal through all the formulas and properties and hardness and color and stuff you have to memorize, and, and the context is exciting. So, ur minerals, wow. Why did those particular 12 form? We think it has to do with, with, with really two principal factors. The first is just what elements were available in sufficient concentration. And if you think about those stars, when a star is large enough, the hydrogen fuses to make helium. And for much of its history, a large star will make helium. Then the helium builds up in the core, and there's not enough hydrogen, so the helium starts fusing and the helium fuses to carbon, and you go through a series of elements. The ones that are produced in greatest abundant, abundance are carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, silicon, magnesium, aluminum, iron. And so it's those elements that are going to, when the star explodes, are going to be in greatest concentrations. And then what you have to do is you have to find a phase, a crystalline phase, that can crystallize at very high temperature because as the envelope ex is expanding, it's cooling, it's cooling, it's getting cooler, but it's also getting much less dense. And if it expands too far, those atoms are too far apart to find each other. But if it's too high temperature, then it's too hot to form a crystal. So all of those early Ur minerals are very high temperature crystals called refractory phases. They're things that melt at 2 or 3 or even 4,000 Celsius. So that's when they crystallize out of that hot, dense gas, if you will. So that's really what causes the Ur minerals. The reason you don't get other minerals is either the elements are too rare, so there's not enough of them to find each other, or they melt at too low a temperature. Why do you call them Ur? Ah, the Ur minerals, yes. Th th this was a bit of, I guess, poetic license, and I apologize to you. When you're talking in literature about the original text, the first text, the most, so for Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, for example, you, you search for the Ur text. And it all stems from the city of Ur, which is the earliest, some people say, the earliest human city. So the, the cradle of civil, the origin of things. So, so the, pre the prefix UR is sometimes used to mean the origin or the first or the most uh, ancient of things. So these are the most ancient, the origin, the, the, the primal source of minerals. In terms of oral history. Hmm? In terms of oral history. Yes, in terms of oral history, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. That was most interesting.
How do you um, deal with the solid-state diffusion issue? I'm really fascinated by the whole idea of the trace elements in these phases and how they could be a record of the mm -hmm. climatic changes, et cetera. But, you know, on these time scales, that kind Absolutely. of diffusion may be relevant. There, there are a lot of aspects of mineral evolution, including the trace element concentrations, where we really have to be worried about changes in the minerals over time. One of the most basic is I talk about increase in mineral diversity. Well, part of that is just the fact that there's some minerals that aren't very stable. So I mentioned in the terms of mercury minerals, there are, there are maybe 20 mercury halides that are soluble in rain. So they form when things dry out and it rains and, and they go away. I, I named a mineral, one of the few minerals I discovered was called fingerite after my colleague Larry Finger. Um, it's a volcanic fumarole mineral. That it's a vanadium mineral that basically every time, they're tiny little crystals, microscopic, green, beautiful things, and every time it rains, the entire world's source of, it's one volcano and, and they all disappear. And then they form again the next time it's dry for a while. So, so these are minerals you're not going to find in the ancient uh, mineralogical record. So doing a graph like the cumulative total of minerals, whereas other things like zircons last billions of years. And so that's, that's one problem. Another thing, as you say, is just diffusion. What, how do these things change? You form a little, as the, the people studying lunar glass beads found, you form a little glass beads with 700 parts per million water, but today the rim only has one part per million because it's diffused out, and so you really, so people were fooled. They were fooled into th the wrong conclusions, and we have to be careful about that too. So I think your implication is, for example, in molybdenites, is it possible that over time, the tungsten or the rhenium might diffuse out or, or might somehow, um, that ratio might change? And we certainly have to be very aware of that in all of these studies, the factoring just the times, the, the kinetic effects that are superimposed on whatever equilibrium we might be hoping we see. <clears throat> Fascinating talk. Um, could you clarify um, when uh, the periodic table was created versus the generation of the Ur minerals? Uh, uh, it's surprising uh, how close those two events are in chronology. As I said, after the Big Bang, and I, this isn't my work, this is, I've read some papers on nucleosynthesis, it's called, and there's, there's a lot of people out there who have spent a lot of time thinking about this, that you began after the Big Bang with a lot of hydrogen, 90% you know, hydrogen, 10% helium, just a trace of lithium. So the first stars are very much hydrogen helium spheres. They have what is very low, what's called metallicity. And then as you go through these fusion processes of helium to carbon, you know, oxygen, neon, and, and all the other elements in sequence all the way up to iron, the iron no longer can fuse, the star collapses, rebounds, that's the supernova. And uh, during the supernova explosion with the incredible crunching together of everything by gravity and then the rebounding, that's when you form the periodic table. So most of the elements of the periodic table are formed during those supernova events. And so the very event that causes the formation of all these elements above iron, you know, any lead or gold or, or silver, uranium, that's all going to be formed during that, you know, fraction of a second when the star implodes and then explodes. And then shortly after that, as the star expands and cools, that's when you get the first mineral. So the periodic table comes, you know, minutes or hours or days before the first crystal of diamond. A theorist probably could narrow it down to a time interval. Mm -hmm.